morning word surf. Can we stand together as we celebrate this morning? Come on. Let's put our hands together. Come on, we worship our King, amen.
I want to thank Jimmy and the boy band. This is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> you guys rock, <laughs> literally. My name is Pastor Bill. I want to welcome you to Word Serve Church. If I haven't had a chance to meet you, I would love to meet you. I'll be right over at that door. I'd love to shake your hand and get to know a little bit about your story. Uh, real quick, I just want to do a couple of announcements for you. We're going to put a QR code on the screen. You can use your phone to snap that. The QR code will take you to a connection card. The connection card is something that is up to you. Fill out as much or as little as you wish. Let us know you're here. And there's also a place for prayer requests. So you can put in your prayer requests. We have a team of people that would love to pray for you. Having said that, we also have opportunities for you to be on the prayer team. So if you are a prayer warrior, if you like to pray for people, let us know. We would love to get you engaged in that way. Uh, the other thing that I would say uh, about prayer is we're big believers in that. So even if you're not on the prayer team, it's okay to pray for one another. And uh, we, we highly encourage that. The other thing we talk about is giving, and this is where you think I'm going to talk about your, your money, and I am, but not yet. So uh, what I'm talking about is time, talent, and treasure, because when we give to God, we give of our time, we give of our talents that he has given us, gifts, abilities, experience, all those things come together, and we would love for you to find a way to plug into that. And then we also give of our money. Uh, actually, it's his money. I don't know if you know that. <laughs> but the way it works is, uh, you know, I was explaining tithing one time at, a, at another church I served in Kentucky. And I said, you know, basically, uh, God gives us everything. And all he asks for is 10%. And this guy said, that's so cool. I get to keep 90%. I thought that was cool. Anyway, so we get to keep 90%, but anyway, so there are many opportunities. Now, having said that, we don't want you to give because it's the thing to do. We don't want you to give by making you feel guilty. We want you to give because it makes a difference in the kingdom. How many people saw the food fair yesterday? How many people were there? I mean, like families that needed help. Anybody know? I heard 320 some families came through and they all got food and that does take some money, that does take some time, it takes very little talent. I mean, if you can hand a bag, you're good to go. But uh, I wanna thank the, those who were able to come, those who were able to pray, those who were able to give. And it was a great exercise between the two congregations. I saw both First Fulcher people out there, I saw WordServe people out there, and we got photographic evidence. So we're gonna be displaying some of those photographs soon, just don't, not the embarrassing ones, try to get my best side. All right. All right. All right, so those are all things that we do here at WordServe because we want to build God's kingdom. We want to make Jesus' name famous, and we think that's the way to go. A couple of things I want to do highlight for you. Uh, WordServe 101, today, if you are interested in what we believe, how we operate, just what WordServe is about, we're doing a 101 class at 1115. We'll meet right by this door, and I'll take you upstairs there. It's about an hour and 10 minutes, depending on questions. And by the end of that, you'll know a lot more about WordSurf and uh, a lot more about me and any questions that you have. Is it uh, mandatory that you join the church after going to WordSurf 101? Absolutely not. This is just informational. Uh, but we do ask that people who want to join the church go to 101 because we want you to understand exactly who we are, what we believe, and how we operate. And if it's not the fit for you, then we'll help you find a place it is. The main thing is we're connected to Jesus. But if it is a fit for you, we would love to have you as a part of our family. So at Words 101, meet me right over here at 11.15, and we'll do that. Uh, kicking off this week, this is a big week, boy, y'all. Uh, I don't know if you know that youth happens tonight from 5 to 7. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh, we have uh, opportunities for people to provide food for youth. And if you want to do that, you don't have to be a parent. You can snap that QR code. And it'll take you right to the signups for the meals. Uh, for example, the person providing food tonight doesn't even have kids here, but he just wanted to do it. So this is a beautiful thing. Uh, and it fills the maximum. If you feed them, they will come. So that's the prime directive of youth group. Oh, and Jesus, right? So that starts tonight. Uh, this also kicks off a whole bunch of community groups and immersed Bible study groups this week. So if you are looking for a place to plug in and learn a little deeper, uh, this is a great time. You're coming at a great time. Men's group kicks off tomorrow night at 645. Women's group kicks off Tuesday at 630, uh, both in the same location. So if you know how to get to one, you know how to get to the other. There are several other groups that are kicking off, and it's all on our website under uh, Connect. So I, I encourage you to take a look at that, wordserve.org. And I'm going to stop talking here because, uh, man, it's time to get back to some great praise and worship by these guys behind me. And I mean these guys. Thanks, Jimmy. <laughs> We stand together. Thirdly, 
get ready for Torch this morning. I just, I do want to thank not just this, this group that you see, but there are so many as Bill talks. There's so many ways that we can give our time, our talents, our treasures, and this is a huge sacrifice of time, not just like I said, there's so many people involved. And so any way that you want to be involved, just helping bless our church family, it's, it's a beautiful thing. And I think they have fun. And they would never admit it to me, but I do think they have a good time. And if you can't tell by the ridiculous way I'm dressed, the Eagles season starts today. Yes. Uh, and I'm not that big of a football fan. I'm just doing this because last year, he's a Chiefs fan, for those of you who don't know. Last year, Bill and I had a huge thing in the Super Bowl. If you didn't watch it, go ahead. It's heartbreaking uh, for one of us. Uh, but with, uh, with as we continue this morning in worship, I just want to take a moment to kind of preface. This is a new song, but as we were talking as a worship team together this, this week, that idea that God calls us to be something that we never could be on our own. We all can look in the mirror and we all feel all those realities of where we fall short, whether whether we've disappointed someone we love, we disappoint ourselves, or worst of all, disappoint our Heavenly Father. Because we feel that burden of, of having to get it right, of struggling and pulling our own weight and I need to figure out how to do this. But that's not the message of the gospel at all. When he builds that bridge, when he does all the sacrifice, all the effort, he gives us his power. So this song is not about being brave to go and tackle and do the things that you want to achieve. As nice as it is when we get to do those things. But he's calling us to look like one person and one person only. His son Jesus. And so the breath that he puts in our lungs, the spirit that he's put inside our hearts, calls us out to step into something we never could become without him. So as we sing, as we call for that bravery this morning, it comes with the humility of knowing we can only do it when he gives us that strength. Amen. That you sing Whoa, So I will let you draw me out beyond the shore Into your grave
brave, come on.
refuge and comfort that can only come a peace that passes all understanding. We plead the blood of Jesus that there would be comfort in those places this morning. If it's a financial need, if it's resources, God, we just pray provision this morning. We plead the blood of Jesus. Everybody brings something in this place this morning. In the name above all names this morning, he is our resource. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He is the God of all creation. So if there is one name that is worthy, if there is one name that can provide all things, comfort, health, resources, refuge, that is the name that is worth praising this morning. Amen. If there is one name, that is the name that's worth praising this morning, the name of Jesus, amen. We stand in that presence this morning. God, you are already here. You were here before we showed up this morning. And you will go with us when we leave this place. God, let us be slowed down because we all bring a heavy burden with us. God, let us be slowed down enough to hear your voice, that you are calling, reaching all the way across the gap to offer that provision, to offer that refuge. God, we want to rest in that refuge because he is worthy, he is worthy, he is worthy. You are worthy of it all. So we just lift this simple cry together. Come on, church. this morning that you alone are worthy of the glory. There have been many great teachers that have taught us many great things, as your son Jesus Christ did, but none of them died for our sins. None of them came back to life as promised by the scriptures. None of them equip us with the Holy Spirit to encounter every day with new strength, new mercy, and an everlasting source of love and grace. God, you alone truly are worthy of it all. God, as we approach you this morning, as we open these pages of Scripture, open our hearts, open our ears, open our minds, so that your word gets firmly planted there. 
And God, may everything that we do be something that glorifies you, that bears the fruit of discipleship. That's only possible by your Holy Spirit. So pour that out on us this morning, God. Help us to encounter your words in a fresh way and help us to leave this place looking more like your son, Jesus Christ, than when we walked in. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Good morning again. My name is Pastor Bill. If you walked in late, I'm still the same guy. <laughs> That's amazing how that works. <laughs> and today we are continuing our sermon series called To My Friend Who Left the Faith. The reason I'm so excited about this sermon series is it's all about those people who have either left the faith or left the church. They actually coined a term in the last two decades for people who have left the church. They call them de-churched. So we used to just have unchurched people who didn't know about Jesus. But a lot of people have heard about Jesus. Unfortunately, a lot of people have come to churches and have bad experiences and decided that that was not for them. So they've de-churched themselves. Or maybe they've just given up on the faith. So this is a series designed for those people who are considering leaving the faith or the church or maybe know someone who has left the faith or the church. Where we've been and where we're going, so we started with They Left, Who's Right? That was last week, by the way. If you ever want to catch any of these, they're all out on our YouTube, on our Facebook, and on our website. You can catch any one of them anytime you want. Uh, today we're talking about I Doubt It. This is what we do. What do we do with doubt? That is the big question of the day. And then in the future, we're going to talk about mean people and the question that gets us all, why? And you can fill in your own blank after that. Why, God, fill in the blank. But today, we're talking about doubt. It's all about doubt. Now, I want to start with a question. How many people have ever flown on an airline? Oh, good, good. How many people completely understand how air travel works, how an airplane flies? Okay, yeah, the engineers, the aeronautical. Okay, great. Yeah, there's always a plants out there, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, here's my point in asking this question. We do things every day that we don't completely understand, but we put our trust in it, don't we? Right? When you get on the airline, what are you expecting to see? <laughs> Nothing. I sleep through the entire flight. <laughs> oh, you, you would expect to see, you know, an airplane that looks airworthy. Maybe two wings would be nice, a couple of engines. Uh, when you look up front, you would expect to see maybe a pilot or two or three, you know. Uh, you would expect to see, like, safety belts in the seat. All, all these things are expectations. Now, we understand some of those things, but when that thing starts rolling down the runway, is your mind immediately going to, how, is this going to work? <laughs> Are we going to make it? I will tell you that, uh, for those of you that don't know, I was, I was an Air Force pilot for 21 years, most of that as an instructor pilot, so I trained a lot of people. And to this day, every time I walk on board an airliner, I go, do I know them? Because <laughs> there's some guys I will not fly with. <laughs> You were expecting me to say they're all quality people. No, they are. They're good. I don't want to, I don't want to disparage that. But here's my point. Yeah, the things that we do all the time, we put our trust in things that we don't completely understand. Now, uh, uh, Jacob, have you ever piloted a plane? Now, now, Jacob is a very intelligent guy. This is not a disparity on any of his intelligence, his background, his ability, none of that. But do you know how to fly a plane? Do you know about Bernoulli's principle? Now, do you know about uh, camber of the wing, angle of attack? No, so who wants to ride when he's flying? <laughs> right? <laughs> but, but, and I want to I uh, help you to understand one thing about air travel just as an example. So when you know, you'll feel better about air travel. I, I want to explain a concept of lift. It follows a principle, and it's called Bernoulli's principle. Bernoulli's principle basically says when you take a fluid and you rapidly accelerate it, it creates an area of low pressure. Right? Isn't that fascinating? Nobody cares, right? So here's what we're going to do. We're going to do a demonstration. This is how airplanes fly, and it's not what you think. Most people think airplanes, you know, they do this. <laughs> no, they don't. No, they don't even do this. Check this out. I'm going to blow over the top of this paper. I'm going to blow a stream of rapid air, and it's going to create an area of low pressure. Watch what happens. You see that paper picking up? That's lift. The lift comes over the top of the wing. That means that flying pulls you up. It doesn't lift you up. It pulls you up. 
the negative pressure, the low pressure is on the top of the wing. That's what provides the lift. I bet you didn't know that before today. And I bet, when, okay, some, the plants know that, right? But I bet when you leave here today, you won't care again, and you'll get on that airline, and you'll go, yeah, it's going to work, because it's a principle. As long as the principle is followed, it's going to work. Now, here's the thing about knowing things. Now that you know this principle of lift, and you can learn a little bit more, there's things that can disrupt that airflow. And when that airflow gets disrupted enough, <coughs> lift stops like that. It can happen like that. And you know what happens when lift stops? You fall like a brick. Now, how many people feel comfortable without flying? <laughs> right, that's when you want to know, does that dude know what he's doing up there, or that gal know what she's doing? She's not, that's going to keep going, right, that, that thing? Yeah. So my point is, we do things we don't understand all the time, and we trust them. But as we get to know more, we get to understand a little more, we get more comfortable with it. But then when you get more comfortable with it, you learn more things that maybe make you less comfortable with it. And you're like, Bill, I thought this was a sermon. Why are we talking about airplanes? <laughs> Do you know me? Anyway, <laughs> yes, it is a sermon, and we are going to talk about Jesus, and we're going to talk about all kinds of things, but here's how it transitions. Listen to this question. If we do things all the time that we don't understand, but we trust completely, why don't we trust God? Right? I don't understand God completely, but do I trust him? For some reason, God is a little bit harder to trust. Uh, God is even harder to understand, I would, I would argue. And a lot of people don't know what to do when they have questions about their faith. These are some of the de-church people, and, and, and doubt is the, the key thing. When I doubt God, where do I go with that? What do I do with that? Is that even allowed? Is doubt a sin? What do I do with doubt? That's the question of the day. So as we uh, talk about this idea of air travel, this is going to be a recurring theme. Uh, we're going to weave this throughout the sermon, so stay tuned for more. But here's the thing. We often put it this way. There's either doubt or there's belief, and there's no room in between. It's either or. You either doubt or you believe. I'm here today to tell you it's not either or, it's both and. You can doubt and believe. You can doubt and have faith. And I'm going to make a case for the fact that doubt properly used can actually strengthen our faith. Don't believe me? Stay tuned. So, whoops, I double tapped. My bad. So I'm going to take one example, and it's kind of a big deal. It's the resurrection of Jesus Christ, right? That's a big deal. And I'm just going to take this one thing, because if you come up to someone and you say, hey, there's this guy, uh, he was crucified, dead, and buried, and then he rose from the dead, and he walked around and talked to people. Want to join us? That's probably not your best intro, because they're going to go, I have a lot of questions. I don't get this whole thing. So we're going to look at the resurrection of Jesus today, and we're going to go into 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. I'm going to ask Leon to plug along there with me so, so I don't have to multitask there. It won't work out well for anyone. So what's going on in the church at Corinth at this time? They have some, uh, it's a church that Paul has been intimately engaged with. He has false teachers coming through. This is, a, there's a lot of ideas flowing through here. There are people that are going back and trying to convince them that what they're doing is pointless and worthless. People don't come back from the dead. This Jesus that you worship? No, no, you've got this wrong. Let's tell you how it really works. So there's this element of doubt creeping in. And if you ever want to summarize the gospel in one easy passage, this is it. Listen to what Paul says. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved. There's a message right there. If you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. Let me pause there for just a second. If we believe something else, we believe in vain. But if we believe in a guy who raised from the dead, we've got it right. Does that make sense to anyone on the surface? <laughs> yes, because of years of faith, right? But it's okay to doubt that as long as we do it properly. Continuing on the reading. For what I received, I pass on to you as of first importance. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That he was buried, yet he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. This is not a surprise to God. And he appeared to Cephas and then to the 12. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all of the apostles. Last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. 
For I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach. This is what you believed. These are the words of God for the people of God, and for these words we are grateful. What a powerful passage. This is all about the resurrection of Christ, and if you think about it, there is one central issue that can derail the whole thing. Did Christ rise from the dead or not? Because lots of people were good teachers. Lots of people died for their cause, for their nation, for their people. But how many of them rose from the dead and appeared to the people who knew him? And to 500, did you, did you catch that? To 500 people. Now, here's, here's a fascinating thing. This was written well before, or this was told well before Paul mentioned this. He's, he's citing an ancient creed. So the timing of this thing is literally probably, they estimate, within two years of Christ's death. This is circulating around. And that's going to be significant here in a second. So Paul's not making this up. He's preaching exactly what he heard. And he's hearing it from the people who were there. Did you catch who he appeared to? The disciples, to Cephas, the people who knew, who saw Jesus firsthand, maybe even doubting Thomas who said, I don't believe, there's another doubter, right? Until I put my hands in, and then he saw, and he believed. So this is fresh. This, this is good stuff. So I'm taking this one example to say, okay, I, I doubt this resurrection. I don't think this is possible. What do I do with that? Well, we're going to put some frameworks around it because if we don't, here's what can happen. You get into the resurrection don'ts. And these are four categories, and maybe you've encountered some of these in your life. The first one is I don't even try. It's just too much. I don't, I don't want to understand that. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know that I believe it, but I don't have time for that. There's, there's a lot of other things going on. The second one is don't doubt because doubt is a sin. If you doubt, you're a terrible Christian. If you doubt, you have no faith. Did Jesus ever say that? No, he said he's, his work is impaired by a, a lack of faith, but it's okay to doubt. It, by the way, if you doubt, you're in great company. Have you heard of Moses? Have you heard of Abraham? Have you heard of, I don't know, every one of the disciples? <laughs> we're in great company when we doubt. Now, it's what we do with the doubt that matters, and that's where we're going next. But before that, let's cover these other categories. Uh, oh, by the way, I grew up in an era and, and in a family. My, my mother was a woman of immense faith. I mean, I, I marvel at her faith. But it was very much a you believe and you don't question because that's how she was raised. Uh, you, you don't question God. It just is. And, and that's the equivalent to the parent saying, uh, do this because I said so. Now, how does that work for you all, right? It works as long as the parents are going to say, uh, do that because I said so. But what happens when that parent leaves? I'm not doing that anymore because I don't know why I believe that. I don't have a compelling why that's going to keep me to that. And, and this, I would argue, this don't doubt syndrome is probably one of the main reasons I think that our youth abandon their faith when they leave because they've been told the, the kids' stories. Now, this is not a slam on children's ministry. <laughs> kids need the basics. They need the facts. But if we just feed them the facts and we say, believe because I said so, or believe because it says it here, what happens when that child grows up and goes out into college or into the world? And people say, you don't really believe that, do you? How is that even possible? Like, explain yourself. And all they know is, well, my mom or dad told me. Is that going to stand up? No, no. What's going to make it stand up is for them to ask those hard questions and find people who will support them as they seek those answers. What's going to support them is people who have lived through their own doubts or are working through their own doubts to say, I don't fully understand, but here's where I'm at, I, I, and I am going to trust, and, and we'll get to that too. So not doubting is not a good approach. Uh, let me just say that. But doubting properly is necessary. More in a minute. The other one is just don't care. What apathy? Now, I don't know personally, I've had a different experience perhaps. I don't know how anybody could read the story of Jesus and recognize that that actually happened. You don't even have to read the Bible to know that Jesus existed. 
Extra biblical sources say he existed. Look at the life he lived, the, di the death he died, and what happened to his church after that. How can you not be moved by that? And you got no flame if you're not on fire after that. And, and maybe it's just you've never heard that story before. Maybe it's never connected to your heart. But how can you hear the story of Jesus and not be moved? Uh, it's a mystery to me. And if you haven't heard the story of Jesus in a way that moves you, well, stick around. There's a lot of groups that are forming. There's this thing, this book that is living and sharp, and, and it will cut through that which is true and false. This will guide us. In fact, as one of my seminary professors said, this is the only book that reads you. This is what the power of, of this book is. Now, the first three, I don't want to try. I don't, I, I don't, I'm not allowed to doubt, and I don't care. Apathy, those are, those are not good. But here's the one I want to encourage us to do. When you doubt, word serve, don't quit. Don't give up on the faith. Don't give up on Jesus. I'll tell you, I'll make you a deal. You can give up on Jesus when Jesus gives up on you. Fair enough? Or your money back. <laughs> yeah, you know that's not going to happen. Nobody's going to take that bet. All right, so what we have to do is we have to know how to doubt. There is a good way to doubt. But here's how we do this. We're going to walk through this a little bit. We doubt with a safety net. We don't just deconstruct faith for the fact of deconstructing faith. We don't just abandon things and throw them away without a network around us. And so one of the things that's so important about this time and this place is this is the week that all these groups are kicking off. I would jump in one. I would get associated with people who are willing to talk about this, who are willing to be honest and say, you know, I don't, I'm struggling here. I don't get this. I, I have this doubt. Can, can you help me walk through this? And here are some great books that I would recommend to you. The Case for Christ by Lee Strobel. Is anybody familiar with that one? So most people know the story. Lee Strobel was an investigative reporter for the Chicago Tribune. His wife found Jesus. Lee was not happy. Lee set out as an investigative journalist to disprove that Jesus was who he said he was. He interviewed all kinds of experts, flew all over the country, and guess what? Lee said, you know what? I think this is true. And he became a Christian and now is a seminary professor and well-published author, The Case for Christ. The Reason for God, if you're an intellectual and you like the logical arguments, that's a great book. Tim Keller is one of the best at that. The Resurrection of the Son of God by N.T. Wright. Well, I had to throw in a UK representative, right? I mean, it's just fair. So, <laughs> and then this other one, Cold Case Christianity by J. Warner Wallace, approaches it like a detective because he wants to investigate the crime, right? So all these people have done great work, and this is just the tip of the iceberg. There's many other resources out there that are reliable. So you can read. You can also study with other people. And, and when I say study, don't just memorize the words. And again, I'm not picking on children's ministry. Please don't hear me. I love children's ministry. I love what they do. But when they go and they memorize the verses, what are they looking for? Can you give me the words verbatim back to me? Not what do they mean? But what did it mean for that time? What was the setting in which those words were mentioned? Yeah, we're not getting into that in first grade, nor should we. But nor should we as adults stay there. And that is my encouragement. When you study, don't just say, okay, I memorized a verse. Great. Well, what does it mean? How does it apply? What did it mean to them? What was the setting? All these things make a difference. For example, in the resurrection, the timing of this, did you catch in the text where we said, he's writing, and he says, some of these people are still alive. So the inference is, if you doubt that Jesus rose from the dead, some of the people that saw him are still alive, go talk to them. They're still walking around. We don't have that luxury, but they did then. The timing is also important because it ties to the social setting at the time. The social setting, if you recall, Jesus was crucified in Jerusalem. Uh, there was a big hubbub between the, the Pharisees, Sadducees, and then they got the Romans to do the dirty work, right? So it's a pretty hostile environment for Jesus. You remember when uh, the, the night of the trial of Jesus, when Peter was standing around the fire warm in his hands, they said, hey... You're one of his guys. What did he say? <laughs> yeah. He said, yes, I am, and I am proud of it. No, he said, no, no, man, you got the wrong. No, I, I'm not your guy, All right? How many times did he do that? Three times. You know what the Bible says about when you say things three times? It must be important. I think that was put there to remind us that no one is infallible unless your name is Jesus Christ. 
See, we all make mistakes. We all stumble. We all have doubts. We all have fears. But it's okay because God is bigger than that. And that social setting was very hostile to those people. And the reason Peter did what he did was he was afraid he was going to end up in court too and maybe on that cross next to Jesus. And the cross was not a pleasant place. They knew about that. So what are the odds that somehow in this social setting, which is super hostile to Christians, that is exactly where the early church is born? That is exactly where three to 5,000 people are, are hearing this and going, you know what? I'm in. Sign me up. And look at the disciples themselves. Even though it doesn't say this you know, literally in the book, you can read around the context of the disciples' experience. What were the disciples doing right after Jesus was crucified? They found out that he was dead. Where did they go? Two answers. Yeah, in hiding. That's, that's the best answer, in hiding. So you either find them, you know what, uh, this Jesus thing didn't work out. I'm going to go back to what I know. I'm going to go fishing. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. I, I know I spent three years and this guy was going to change the world, but, well, that's over now, so I'll go fish. Sounds pretty good, doesn't it, guys? Uh, let's be honest. <laughs> right? Or... Uh, let's find them all behind a locked door. Right? They're, they're in fear for their lives, and yet they encounter the risen Christ, and something changes. And we don't have the details of all the conversations of when he appeared to these people. We don't have the details of all the teachings and all the experiences that he had. But what we do have is a completely changed group of disciples. They go from behind locked doors to all over the globe. They go from hiding to not hiding anything. In fact, they were so out in the open, they were all prematurely killed except for one. They gave their lives when before they were behind a locked door. What changed? Well, it must be the risen Jesus. That's the only thing I can put my finger on. And if that's what caused that, then that must be true. Jesus must be raised from the dead. So you see, what I've done with my doubt is I've asked a few simple questions. I've surrounded myself with people with this uh, is of prime importance, with some good study materials. And I've worked my way through, how can this be possible? But I still have a stumbling point because I don't understand how a, a person dead comes back to life. I've never experienced that myself. I'm not that deep of a sleeper, but you know, <laughs> I, I tend to wake up early. But some people can, you know, like, uh, I slept like the dead and I came back to life. No, I've never had that experience. Uh, and, and if you have, let me know. I would love to know. But let's go back to our airplane here for just a second. Because here's what happens. I think a lot of times in doubt, we seek to understand. And when it comes to God, like there's a ton of other stuff. Like I said, we do all the time that we don't understand, but we trust. But when it comes to God, we want to understand. And that's why we ask questions like, why God? Or how does this make sense? But here's the challenge. If we wait to place our faith in God until we fully understand God, then when will we fully understand God? This is a non-starter. I know you probably can't read this, and I did this for me, not for you, but Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, if we try to understand God, listen to what the prophet says. This is God speaking through the prophet Isaiah. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. I am never going to understand God. I'm never going to fully understand God. And you know what? I'm okay with that. I don't want a God I can fully understand. I want a God that is supernatural, above nature, one that is capable of creating the universe, of sustaining life, one that is capable of sending a son. I don't understand how all this works, but somehow that son took on my sins and died on a cross for me. And then that son came back to life. Do I fully understand it? Nope. Do I trust it? See, now that's the key. Because if I can take my doubt and, and attempts to understand, can I understand enough to trust God? Not fully understand God, but can I understand enough to trust him? Listen to what Proverbs has to say. 3, 5, and 6 says this. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. There it is. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your paths straight. This is not a surprise to God. He knew this was coming all along. That's why he peppers things throughout his prophets, throughout the Proverbs, throughout this whole thing of Scripture. It prepares us to accept this. 
that prepares us enough that we can trust this God. And if I can trust this God, I can follow this God, even though I don't fully understand this God. That gap, by the way, where I trust but I don't fully understand that gap is called faith. It's not a blind faith. It's not asking you to check your IQ at the door. It's not saying, don't ever doubt, that's a sin. It's saying, there's going to be things that you can't understand, but can you understand enough to trust God? And if you can trust God, can you follow him, even though you don't fully understand in faith? Now, all of a sudden, my doubt has caused my faith to be stronger. Did you catch what the gap is? Faith. That's what we filled in, the gap with faith. And my doubt helped my faith get stronger. Don't fear doubt. Don't avoid doubt. Don't welcome it like, okay, today I'm going to open Scripture and see what I can doubt. <laughs> But when you encounter it, and sometimes you encounter that in a friend, and, and sometimes we pull back when I, oh, yeah, I kind of doubt that that's true. Ooh, I don't know enough to counter that. I, I'm not an apologist. I, I think I'll just back off of that. I don't know what to say. That's one approach. Probably not going to help your brother or sister. But another one would be, you know what? I, I never looked at it that way. Hey, why don't we explore that together? And by the way, there's this group of people. Why don't you bring that question to us? And, and let's pour through the scriptures. Let's go through some of these trusted sources Let's figure this thing out. And in the process, that doubt makes our faith all stronger. I'm kind of big on community groups. I don't know if you picked up on that. Because that's where this happens. This opportunity to explore, to get deeper in our faith, to conquer doubt. Now, will we fully erase doubt? Probably not. Just like I will never fully understand God until I meet him face to face. But I can get enough where I can trust God. And if I can trust God, I can follow God. If there's one thing to fear, Lord, sir, don't fear doubt. Here's what you should fear. Fear the shallow faith that has never been tested, that the world will dismantle unless we stand on solid ground. That's the power of doubt used properly because our God is a big God. He can handle it. The question is, can we? Will you pray with me, please? God, we thank you for the scriptures that you have written through the people throughout the ages. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that guides us. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who lived this. And especially for the one who died for our sins and was raised again. And God, while we may not fully understand all of this, I pray this morning that every individual that is struggling with doubt out there would have a moment of illumination just enough to see that you are trustworthy, you are who you say you are, you do what you say you will do, and you don't do what you say you won't do. God, I pray that that begins a journey, that as we struggle with doubt, we come together. We come together as groups, and we come together around the scripture. We ask the hard questions, not fearing them, but understanding that the Holy Spirit can use them to make us stronger. God, we don't do this uh, just as an intellectual exercise. We pray that this permeates every cell of our being. This goes down deep into our hearts, not just our heads. And so that everything we do becomes a reflection of who you are. God, my prayer is that you would strengthen us this morning in ways that you never have before. Let this day be the first day of that journey if we've never done this before. And if we have, help us to keep walking that journey so that through our doubts, we become stronger. We love you. We can't wait to see what you do in this season in our lives. And we promise all the honor and glory and praise goes to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we stand together as we close this morning? This is a simple song. But it is the foundation of everything that we believe in this morning. Everything that makes all of this possible. Just like Bill said, is that he was there, he died, and he rose from the dead. And that's the foundation of where we are. So can we sing?
fire going you got wet wood we serve a risen christ go in the name of the father son and holy spirit equipped to spread the good news doubt or not he is who he says he is in jesus name amen, amen. thank you for coming